Welcome, everybody. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Thanks for joining us.
Welcome everyone. Uh, looks like some folks are still dropping by. We'll get started in just another minute. All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Uh, so let's see, logistics, uh, if you have questions along the way, I have some colleagues uh, that will be answering them live. So feel free to use the Q&A section at the bottom to ask your questions. And if your Zoom version allows it, you may wanna configure it in side-by-side uh, -side mode. So for example, when I, I'll be showing some parts with a couple of the cameras, you could see the parts and uh, the slides as well. So, and uh, we'll be using some polls uh, as well. So let's get started. So uh, today we'll talk a little bit about uh, supply chain re-engineering that is possible, that's taking place with uh, the commercialization of additive manufacturing technologies. So talk a little bit about the design trends uh, and the challenges that are driving it, uh, what additive manufacturing offers uh, for supply chain, supply chains and supply chain challenges, and then uh, the impact uh, on both on the entire product life cycle, really, from development to manufacturing and even in the aftermarket. And uh, we'll review probably a few dozen examples from the field with a couple of them we'll delve into with a little bit deeper. So with that, let's um, put a little context, desktop metal. Uh, we're a five-year-old company bringing 3D printing uh, to both engineering and manufacturers. Some of our customers, uh, so they're firms small and large around the world uh, in a variety of markets. Uh, some names you'll, names you'll recognize, others uh, you won't. And that really speaks to the sort of the readiness of uh, metal 3D printing technology and the adoption of it, the accessibility. You don't have to uh, be Ford or Toyota to buy a system. You could be a, a five-person service bureau in uh, in the Italy, for example. So this is uh, what some of our customers look like from space. Uh, and today I'll talk mostly about the three systems we have, the studio system, the shop system, and the production. Uh, and you'll see through the applications where each one is a fit. So let's dive right into the what are the design challenges and the critical issues going on in the manufacturing? So one is designs are getting more and more uh, complex. Uh, sustainability is a major trend going on. So for example, the 100% uh, recirculating vehicle, the, the, the notion that 100% of the parts making an, uh, a vehicle should be recyclable. You know, with plastics, they're actually not at all recyclable. Uh, and uh, with metals are, uh, many metals are 100% recyclable. So there's a movement going on over the course of, uh, you know, over a couple decades to really create sustainable uh, vehicles. Uh, mass customization is a major trend. Uh, so that's the idea of you're mass producing things, but you can also customize them to the, uh, to all sorts of uh, dimensions. It could be golf clubs, it, it could be other uh, parts. It could be parts for mechanisms. Uh, and uh, invariably, life cycles are getting shorter. And so compressing time to market is, is an important one. So that's the initiatives. And then if you think about the uh, complexity specifically around supply chains, 100 years ago, Henry Ford uh, grew the rubber tree plants to make the tires. Ford was, and other automakers were entirely vertically integrated. Everything was happening there, uh, sort of start to start to when the vehicle rolls off the assembly line. Today, a great deal of parts are outsourced. Uh, you have sub-assemblies, parts uh, being created in a variety of 
methods, locations, uh, and then they're assembled, assembled into sub-assemblies, ultimately products. Those products are shipped around, warehoused. If you think about the global economy, at any one time, there's several trillion dollars worth of parts uh, on, on uh, cargo ships. And so that is quite a complex, uh, complex network, and uh, uh, th that network uh, uh, can be challenged. Uh, so resiliency of supply chain networks, not having one pinch point uh, shut off your production line uh, is, is a key thing that, that folks are realizing more and more. So some of the challenges is, so this is kind of a, a long list that we're, we're seeing in, in uh, the marketplace. I am curious, let's put up our first poll, which is to see which of the following supply chain, chain challenges do you face? And so I will read them while you click on the polls. So there's delays in getting parts for new products for uh, functional or, or market testing. There's uh, the ability to test multiple products in parallel, uh, procuring custom or one-offs kind of parts. Let's see, I'm just gonna check the question. Great, great, uh, great point. Uh, you're actually seeing two polls, uh, two poll questions in this poll. One is the supply chain challenges you've seen and then what industry uh, you find yourself in. So we'd, we'd love to get your take on both of those. Anyway, other challenges are the, uh, bottlenecks of machine shops or lead times for foundries, so let's say for parts that might be cast. Um, managing, coordinating uh, the, the logistics around all of the parts and, and sub-assemblies. Um, inventory turnover, inventory costs. Uh, and finally, this notion of, uh, of creating replacement or custom parts. Is it easy? Is it hard? So at this point, uh, let's think uh, we have we have a good perspective. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, share the results. So let's see. Looks like one of the key challenges is time and effort to fabricate new tooling. Great, we'll be talking about that. But it looks like there's a, a nice, well, nice range. There's a range, uh, pretty broad. Uh, this, this covers a lot of challenges that, that many of you are facing. All right, so let's Let's uh, move forward and see how additive manufacturing actually can save the day in some of these. So why are people excited about metal 3D printing? Rapid prototyping is probably the first place where uh, 3D printing originated, and that was with you know, printing plastic. Uh, and so it was really to see form and fit. Often you couldn't test function. But now with metal 3D printing, you can test function. So of course, the first place where in a product development, uh, in a product life cycle, uh, 3D printing is used is to prototype. But then there's other benefits that because you can now print metal parts, you can do things you couldn't before. And so for example, now you can create one assembly out of uh, multiple parts. It could be one part could replace five or six components that get assembled. So here's one example of that. You can create geometries you couldn't create before. That has uh, profound implications for a product development. Uh, you can do cut design customization where imagine making en masse uh, parts that are all a little bit different or a lot different. You can uh, match, uh, match the production, what you're printing that day to the immediate market demand. Uh, you could create rapid tooling. We'll talk about that. Here's uh, that ratchet set. Uh, ratchet, it's a pneumatic uh, ratchet from a, a assembly line. This would be quite tricky or probably impossible to, to machine. And finally, with the advent of a binder jetting, mass production of metal parts is now possible. And we'll take a look at some of those examples. All right, so how does this impact the supply chain of tomorrow? Let's look uh, life cycle stage by stage. So first, additive manufacturing and product development. So one key area where uh, metal 3D printing uh, is a win is you can now do functional prototyping, but also expand that to rapid design studies, testing things in parallel. So you can prove out multiple uh, design ideas and you don't have to wait. Ultimately, the part might be cast or produced via machining or some other method, but it might be beneficial if you have the ideas over the weekend, you start printing on Monday and on Friday, you're testing the parts or testing the design variations. Here's an example from a transmission shift fork. So here's the part. 
inside a new transmission design. Ultimately, this part, uh, this would be quite challenging to machine. So this, this part would be cast. And uh, maybe when you're making 50,000 transmissions a year, that is a perfect, casting is a fantastic uh, uh, production method. But if I want to evaluate three designs and I don't have the casting uh, process, the, the uh, wax molds, et cetera, set up, it's going to be tricky to get that. And so then if you think about the non-recurring engineering, other fees, and so for all those reasons, early on, you may want to source it by uh, 3D printing the part. Another great example of um, metal 3D printing is complex bill of materials. Think about it. Every part that is on the bomb needs to be sourced. You got to manage it. This notion of some parts are standard, other parts are custom. How do you procure the custom parts? You might have, if, if it's a complex assembly, uh, you might be able, you, you might need uh, to, to manage and think about the routing sheets and, and uh, the tools, jigs, fixtures required to assemble all the parts. And the more parts, by the way, the more fasteners. And, and the more parts, the more labor cost. And so, of course, every interface within the assembly is a point of failure. So that's that's the nightmare of us as mechanical engineers, product designers, dealing with, with, with complex bills of materials. What is additive manufacturing's answer to that? Well, the answer is you can do assembly consolidation. You can take parts that used to be that used to be one part. Let's see, I've got a couple parts within reach. So here is a water wheel. This is part of a BMW um, race car cooling system, but by being able to 3D print it and make it for just a few dollars a piece, you combine an assembly out of multiple components into one, uh, it's a lower cost part to produce, and then bind with binder jetting, it's now affordable to put into mass production vehicles, not just the race cars. Another couple examples. So this is a rotating manifold. This would be could be cast, though there's a non-recurring engineering fees associated with that. Uh, and uh, the alternative is you might machine them as several components and weld them together. And yet, I think there's one more. There's one more. Here's one of these. I'm just trying to match these parts to what I have right next to me. So you can see this would be a nightmare to machine. You probably weld this out of several components. Um, increasingly complex parts can be uh, can be designed, consolidated uh, out of several components and with 3D printing, both in, in low quantities as well as mass production, you can, uh, that can be part of your assembly line. Um, here's a few examples, crankshaft gear assembly, normally uh, made out of uh, welding two separate gears together. Now it can be printed as one part uh, and procuring custom parts and, and one-offs in uh, machine design. So you have the, uh, you can do gears, uh, you can do cast. Uh, let's see, here's a housing uh, that we'll talk about. Uh, early on in the design cycle, you might have an impeller design. You want to evaluate several different options. Wouldn't it be nice, just like in the parametric solid modeler, you adjust the number of veins parametrically without breaking a sweat? Wouldn't it be great if you could then take the digital model and print it also without breaking a sweat? Now you can do that. So that's kind of early in the design process. Later, with uh, once the product is ready to move to manufacturing, real-time tooling begin, becomes uh, a need. So you th think about it, there's a, a big challenge associated with creating just uh, the, the jigs, fi uh, jigs, fixtures, and tooling. So things that hold parts or things that deform parts because it could be stamping dies, um, extrusion dies, mold inserts. It takes time to fabricate all of that required to stand up a new manufacturing line. So in the old days, you, there was really no path, uh, no path to, there was really no alternative to, you have to wait till the design is fixed and then you pay for the tooling. With 3D printing, you can dramatically compress uh, the time it takes to fabricate tooling, including doing it almost in, serial, in a serial fashion uh, while the product is being developed. And so, the additive manufacturing's answer is now you can 3D print the tooling. Uh, by the way, I see some folks have questions. You're raising your hand. Feel free to ask questions right in the Q&A portion of the, of the Zoom interface. So let's take a look at a few. Um, there's, there's mold inserts. So first of all, you can now print uh, molds to near net shape and do post-processing um, if required. Um, you can do internal cooling channels, print in internal cooling channels. So that would increase the cycle time. You can make 
mold inserts, uh, you can do coining fixtures, um, extrusion dies. So that could be complex geometries, uh, even stamping dies. Uh, you can print jigs, fixtures, so things that hold, things that align. We'll take a look at a couple examples. Uh, what they all have in common, actually, let me take a look. So you see that robotic end effector. Here is the end effector. This is just an example of this tooling. This, this particular end effector uh, goes on a robotic arm and uh, puts a, an O-ring uh, from one onto, onto an assembly. And so these metal parts are actually quite tricky to machine. They're relatively thin uh, and it's kind of a nightmare because they need to be thin, precise. They're about a millimeter thick in the, the thinnest portions. With 3D printing, you can print a whole bunch of them at a time and then uh, you have them, no need to take up the machinist's time, just as an example. Uh, another great example of real-time tooling nearly real-time tooling is here's a twin screw extruder uh, it's blending a, uh, a ceramic slurry into uh, into a rectangular shape so it starts uh, as, a, as a, basically a circle this is a loft uh, it's easy to model with a parametric solid modeler like on shape or SolidWorks, uh, you start with a circle and through a guide curve or some other way you loft to a, the final shape you need. Easy to model, hard to manufacture. This would be a five axis job if you didn't um, have 3D printing. With 3D printing, uh, instead of a couple thousand dollars, this is uh, less, less than a hundred dollars to print that. And as soon as you know you need it, you can uh, just as easily print it and, and install it. This was uh, start to finish within a week of the design. This was on the manufacturing floor. So the whole idea is you can now bring up manufacturing lines. If you think about all the things on the manufacturing line that will require metal jigs, fixtures, or even tooling like this, um, you can much, much faster and at a much lower cost stand up a production line. I'll give you a, let's do a deep dive on one company, Alpha Precision Group. Great company in the St. Mary's, Pennsylvania. So this is, uh, they're a leading vendor of, of uh, precise metal components, uh, manufactured, fabricated primarily through metal injection molding or powdered metallurgy. They brought in 3D printing for two key reasons. One is to reduce the tooling costs for their entire uh, production line. And two, uh, to be able to provide samples to customers either earlier in a product's life cycle, so before they actually tool up and uh, create the custom tooling for the parts, they want to be able to provide samples early on so they can print those samples uh, so customers can verify, okay, these are, this is exactly what we need. And so that aftermarket, after the major production run is done, they can still produce parts on demand without needing to keep uh, tooling around. So that's APG. I'll give you a couple couple examples from uh, from that. Actually, let me get up because one of them is uh, over here. All right, let's see if this was worth it. That little trip was worth it. So here is this uh, end of arm tooling. I'm gonna hold that up. So this is, uh, this goes on the end of a robotic arm. It holds up what it does is hold a forging that is quite hot uh, and that's undergoing some forces uh, for the uh, machining operations. Uh, and so it has to be metal because of those reasons. And being able to create this shape and lightweight it, by lightweighting this end of arm tooling, um, they reduce the wear and tear on the robotic arm, the servos. And uh, so that increases, A, prolongs the lifetime. Of the, of the of the servos of the motor and b by reducing the weight uh the inertia is lowered everything can move faster so it's a it's a big productivity boost for the production line let's see another great example is uh, chuck jaws so here is the chuck jaws made of three of these components uh it's holding a workpiece during machining so this i'll hold this up this is the one of the three chuck jaws you see it's, uh, it's not a nightmare to machine, but this would, making three of these, would keep a machinist busy for the better part of a day or two. Instead, 3D print the part and uh, pop it right into the, into the CNC machines. Another great example is um, in the assembly line, the screwdriver tool. So let's see, 
here's the tool. Now this, uh, this is a pneumatic screwdriver tool that used to be done, uh, the operation used to be done by an operator by hand. You can imagine the, the kind of repetitive uh, work, kind of repetitive work injuries that, that, that can arise from that. Um, and so they redesigned this uh, to basically be a pneumatic screwdriver that uh, tightens to a specific a predetermined tightness, um, the screws right on the production line. So here's what's great about this example. So first of all, you, you kind of get a sense, this is the heart of it. Um, and it's quite a, this is quite a tricky bunch of parts to, if you were to machine this, this would be, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's EDM, this would be quite a nightmare, especially to get the, the internal structures of there. This is a great example because to machine this might be $10,000 or more. This was instead uh, printed for just a few hundred dollars at a dramatic both cost and time savings. But the, what's transformative about this particular example is they never would have undertaken this. They can't walk around. If every complex machining job is ten or twenty or $30,000 to create a new tool, that they're not going to upgrade their factory that way. But when you have a studio system, when you have a way to print, uh, print the, uh, the, the parts without breaking a sweat, without loading up the machinist time or going outside, you can suddenly uh, reinvent the, your manufacturing operation that in, in ways that you never would have without 3D printing. So that's, uh, that's, that was um, ma uh, the rapid tooling and, and how, how do you stand up a, a production line quickly with, with additive. Next, next, let's dive right into uh, mass production. Gonna take a sip. So, the challenge that we all face uh, inevitably as we move into production is the tooling and other related non-recurring engineering charges to uh, to stand up and start producing parts. So, whether one example is casting. So casting, great, great method, been around for a few thousand years, um, and it's great for creating uh, complex parts and shapes that would be uh, hard to produce some other way. But if you think about it, there are long foundry lead times in the NRE charges. So you really need to nail the design, and then there's not a whole lot of flexibility in changing that. And if you need to change the design, you gotta, you gotta wait uh, another few months typically, and there's uh, the inevitable tooling costs. The other thing is, think about the process that typical, so this is a really a, a typical casting process. There are a lot of different steps. And so you wind up not with just long delay times till you get the first article off that assembly line, uh, but, but it's hard to make changes, it's expensive to make changes, and you now have all sorts of whip and inventory during the fabrication process. Maybe the overall process may be literally start to finish weeks or longer uh, to get the part from the moment that it starts to be worked on. And so, uh, by the way, feel free, I'll call out again, uh, folks are asking questions, feel free, to, feel free to ask more and my colleagues will, uh, will answer them. So additive manufacturing's answer to the, those long lead times is uh, mass production via binder jetting. So let's see what, what that actually means. So binder jetting for mass production. We have adapted a desktop metal printing systems that are built around both the chemistry and the powder supply chain of metal injection molding. Um, this is a, an established process uh, that's, uh, metal injection molding is based on powdered metallurgy. Parts have been made with uh, you know, Preston Sinter te technology. Cars have been dri uh, driving around with connecting rods based on uh, Preston Sinter technology for over a century. So these are established, well-known, well-understood processes. Metal injection molding is, uh, uh, leverages a lot of powdered metallurgy principles. Uh, and our systems, both for the low volume and the studio system, as well as the shop and production systems, are fundamentally based on metal injection molding powders. So these are widely established, uh, validated processes, decades old with uh, well-defined ASTM ISO standards. So there's rigorous, rigorous tests um, on, on how the impurities, mechanical properties that the parts must meet. And uh, this process, the beauty here is the process 
metal injection molding approach uh, supports uh, uh, over 100 different alloys. So by betting on binder jetting, you're betting on uh, all of the kinds of powders and uh, alloys that can be uh, created using metal injection molding. So it's a, it's a rich library of, of metals to choose from. The shop system uh, introduced by Desktop Metal uh, uh, at the end of last year. We'll, we are, you'll, you'll see a whole bunch of parts being printed uh, with the shop system. Uh, the, it will be this summer, this summer, the uh, world is a little bit dynamic right now, but it looks like this summer, uh, the first systems will be shipped to the early adopters and uh, will be general availability is uh, scheduled for uh, later this year. The basic process is you print uh, layer by layer, uh, basically a layer of powder is put down and a binder uh, is sprayed from an inkjet nozzle to define the geometry of where, which will be solid, which won't be. Um, and this happens layer by layer. Uh, the, those parts are then depowdered uh, and uh, they're sintered. The entire process is uh, three, four days, start to finish, and you can make by the way, it's, it's worth noting, uh, noting binder jetting recycles the powder. So there's no, uh, there's no notion of uh, scrap or, or worrying about recycling the shavings or some, some materials or recycling the chips and some materials, you know, titanium, others, you, you cannot safely recycle even. And so um, in, up, in situations where you want to keep everything under one roof and, and uh, totally recycle the consumables, this is, uh, this is a process that lends itself well to that. Uh, the beauty of binder jetting is you can do, you can make cost effective parts, whether it's small batches or all the way up to mass production. And it could be relatively small parts that cost a couple cents, or it could be relatively large complex parts. Um, so here's, here's one example of a fairly complex gear or, well, I'll show you some other parts. And it can be really, this is a cost effective uh, solution. Not only do you not pay for tooling, you can start printing as soon as you have the digital file, but it's uh, cost effective through large volumes. You can be cost competitive with casting or other methods up to 100,000 uh, parts per year or even beyond. And the added benefit that is absolutely unique to, to 3D printing is you can combine mass customization with mass production. So you can make a whole build box full of parts and those parts can be different. They can be entirely different, either in small ways. For example, imagine serializing every every part with a unique number, or they can be actually different parts. For example, um, golf clubs that are all a little bit different, or for a, a family of uh, fa family of sizes and, and uh, geometry configurations. So, really, the way to think about this is binder jetting dramatically accelerates mass production of metal parts. You don't need tooling. You can compress the lead time. Uh, for a lot of the key processes that you might alternatively be using, whether it's metal injection molding so that you don't need to make the tooling for those molds, um, or whether it's the, this, all the steps involved in casting or Preston Center kind of uh, operation, or you now don't need to make a progressive die to create a, a part. So a few examples, and I'll actually show you live, but this gives you a feel for some of the kinds of parts that are, that are possible to achieve Let's see if I can flip to this video. So here's a few examples. Uh, first of all, to give you a feel for the kind of precision you can have, let's zoom in on this part. So you see it next to the quarter, so you kind of get a sense for the size. This is a part that was binder jetted. The surface finish is uh, about two, three microns average surface roughness. 2-3 micron RA, and you can make parts that are either relatively small, so I'm gonna show you this part, and maybe zoom in on that a little bit. Sorry if it's not this perfect focus. Or you can make uh, parts that are relatively large. So for example, uh, this is a shift handle, you'll, you'll see as an example, relatively relatively soon. So this is a custom shift handle for an, for an automobile uh, right out of the furnace. Or check out this relatively complex part. So this would be typically made out of uh, either cast, and so there's a whole supply chain challenge of, of that, or it could be machined and welded out of several components. Let's zoom in and see, you can see some of the, the kind of detail that's 
entirely achievable. And uh, of course there's, um, well, you, so you can do small parts or relatively small parts that, that fit in your hand, um, as well as you can make whole mechanisms with binder jetting. So here's a neat little example. Again, I'll zoom in. So here is, these were printed, this assembly of gears was printed in one place. So you can make joints, hinges, uh, you know, entire gear assemblies uh, pretty effortlessly. All right, let's zoom out. Maybe that's, all right, I'll show another, just one, another example of a part, but this would be, this would require, you know, sliders and other uh, possible complex ways to produce. This is a parking, um, a seatbelt pulley. So parts like this would require serious tooling and uh, have uh, lead times and thousands of dollars, tens of thousands most likely, to gear up. With 3D printing, you get, you get all that complexity for free and you can start printing right away. So some more examples, just to give you a flavor. Uh, let's switch cameras back. All right, and you can, uh, uh, figures, I'll, well, I'll show it this way. Entire sub-assemblies can now be printed. So this is a, actually, no, you know what? I will try to flip back. This is an entire transmission system for, for a uh, consumer power drill. So you see there's different gears. There's a whole bunch of gears here. And each one of them typically would be metal injection molded. And instead of, instead of metal injection molding and probably a million dollars worth of tooling, you can now just 3D print it. So the entire assembly uh, really changes the, the complexity, time frame, everything for the supply chain. All right, let's flip back to that. So uh, a few other examples, uh, this water wheel, as I already mentioned, this, is a, this, is a, this was a plastic assembly made of several components. BMW engineering team redesigned it. Initially, this was used uh, uh, to, and it was redesigned it for 3D printing. Initially, it was an expensive part that could only be uh, affordable in their racing cars. And by using binder jetting to create this for $5, it could actually be something for commercial vehicles. Uh, another great example, parts like this uh, worm gear reducer or the housing for it could be cast or could be uh, binder jetted. That's a great example, custom manifolds. Again, complex geometries that you might normally cast, but you can 3D print. Hydraulic uh, pump housing, I got that somewhere here. Uh, where is it? Ah, here it is. So this pump housing, and then imagine you might have a family of uh, somewhat, all somewhat different pump housings. Instead of having to design uh, not just design, but, but create all the tooling and, and the supply chain challenges of setting up these multiple parts, just print what you need, print the design you need. Compress it, A, in terms of complexity, but also uh, dramatic time uh, delay savings. So time delays, dramatic compression in, the, in the, the calendar time. You can make complex parts like impellers. Uh, here's a roller screw uh, mechanism. Here's uh, the, these parts, they could be different designs, so different pitch, different dimensions. Um, with, uh, again, first of all, you, you might have to cast it or assemble out of several pieces or just 3D print it. All right, I think we've uh, driven the mass production point home. Now let's talk a little bit about the distribution networks. So today you have, uh, it's very common to have a small number of factories, you have multiple tiers of distribution, and at any one time, trillions of dollars worth of goods are somewhere in inventory. They could be sitting uh, in a warehouse or they could be on cargo ships. And there's often literally months of time between uh, a part getting manufactured and it getting into the hands of uh, the consumer or the industrial customer. So what does 3D printing offer you in that case? It's very simple. You can print what you need, when and where you need it. Dramatically reduce inventory. Instead of keeping, if you don't know what part breaks or what parts you're gonna need, production lines are, have, uh, for the last century have been, have been uh, managed to uh, 
let's produce large enough samples so that the large enough quantities so that there's always uh, inventory to, to address the need, but that has a huge inventory costs. Mm -hmm. um, you also have, uh, instead of centralized production with 3D printing, put the printers, and they can be something like the studio printer for low volume manufacturing, wheel it through the door uh, and uh, start printing and centering parts right in your office, or uh, wheel the shop system right into your machine shop, or replace a factory full of CNC machines with uh, uh, the production system. You can really place, uh, place the equipment where you need it. Um, you can now think of it as a digital warehouse where you're sending and managing the flow of files across boundaries, not a, the flow of goods, and there's no tariffs to take into account. And you can really match production rate to the demand, reduce inventory and produce just what you need when you need it. And if you think about it, with processes like castings, or parts that might be initially cast and then post-processed, that might happen in multiple different locations because uh, the, the foundry where something is getting cast might be very far away from where the finishing operations might take place. With uh, 3D printing, you can locate the printing right after the parts come out of the furnace, start doing the finishing operation. So everything can actually be co-located. So it, it dramatically reduces not just inventory, but the whole where does the part have to travel during its manufacturing process. Uh, another common scenario is uh, this notion of maintenance, repair, and order uh, in operations, maintenance, repair, operations scenarios where you need to replace parts. It could be on the shop floor, could be um, on a job site somewhere. This is an example. Let's see. I don't think I have that gear here, but there's another great example you'll see. Uh, here's a gear that is at the heart of uh, the transmission gearbox. It's a sun gear for uh, earth drilling equipment. Normally it takes three months to get it from China with uh, those three months are reduced to a short number of weeks when uh, printed on the studio system. That's a great example. You can imagine uh, hard to machine uh, components. This is a valve body uh, made of Inconel uh, because it's a corrosive fluid. There's a lot of materials or super alloys that are hard to machine. Um, and so how about instead of worrying about machining them, instead of worrying about stocking them, uh, just print them when you need them. Uh, nozzles, here's another great example. Cast part, binder jetted instead. So that's, uh, that's this notion of the distribution networks. Let's dive a little bit, see some more examples from the maintenance, repair, and operations. So here's a, a, a desktop metal customer, John Zinc Combustion. This is a leading vendor of uh, emissions control equipment emissions uh, control and uh, combustion systems. Uh, and they rolled out a manufacturing, uh, additive manufacturing initiative back in uh, 2016. They make two sort of classes of uh, parts. One is jigs, fixtures, tooling for the manufacturing floor. The other though is either early in the development cycle when they need to create new designs. And so they want to test multiple uh, design ideas. And at the end of the uh, life cycle uh, in the aftermarket to replace parts. Let's take a look. First example from the early stage of the uh, product life cycle uh, is a, a nozzle used in a, a marine burner. This part, first of all, was uh, redesigned and is now more efficient with additive manufacturing. Initially, it was uh, it was a part that was constrained by uh, the way you would machine it. And so there's these relatively small internal channels that mix air and fuel uh, that are much more efficient when you can curve them and make them slotted channels. Uh, each one of these nozzles saves about $150,000 in uh, fuel for the tanker. So A, this part was used during the, uh, 3D printing was used during the development of uh, uh, the design. Once the design is finalized, when they do wear out or need to be replaced on the, uh, uh, these giant tankers, you can on-demand print because there's not a fleet of a thousand of these. There's a few dozen of these tankers. So now you can keep a studio system and print these parts just as you need them or have a couple on hand. Another great example uh, is uh, aftermarket order. So here's a, a safety device uh, for, that's located on the USS Blue Ridge. It's a warship. Part broke, needed a replacement. The casting uh, facility was no longer operating. And so instead, this was printed right on the 
studio system. And the third example that I happen to have a copy of here, this is a part of a combustion engine, a uh, burner tip for a uh, combustion engine uh, from 1967. Now, in 1968, it was relatively straightforward to get another one of those parts. You see how gigantic this is? This part is uh, pretty big. All right, so this part it would have been easy to get in 1968. There was a stock of them, but 52 years later, it's a lot harder. And so uh, what, what's the alternative? The alternative is dig out the print, model it up in a, a pretty quick time and uh, 3D print it. And so bottom line across a whole range of applications in the heavy, in, uh, heavy duty, heavy industry, so that's construction, uh, oil and gas, uh, a, lot, a lot of industrial plants, uh, you can, you often need parts. The parts you need are not in huge volume. And so mass production process might not make sense, but 3D printing, uh, something like the studio, which is great for low volume production, uh, is a great solution for that. And the last stage of the aftermarket is customized or replacement parts. And so let's take a look at some examples. First example, uh, custom gear shifts. So for example, here's the, let's see, I'm just trying to grab a couple of these. So here's knobs, here, here's the gear shift handle, and here's the metal printed part right on the handle. Um, imagine customizing it, customizing it. So this is from a company, innovative uh, new company called Twicket where customers can choose patterns they want, apply those patterns, those parts are printed on demand, and now you have a unique, um, unique component for your, for your vehicle or, or other parts. So this is, this is a, a different pattern and uh, gold plated. So you can imagine an infinite amount of uh, kind of variation for products like this, whoops. A couple more uh, gear shift handles. Um, this was all printed on the studio system. Another example of uh, replacement parts for a, uh, uh, cooling engine for cooling system for a uh, vintage engine. So here's a Bosch engine from uh, 1960 on a Mercedes, and this is a thermostat housing. If the thermostat housing breaks or needs replacement for, uh, for some other reason. What are your chances? Again, in 1963, it was easy to get that part was being cast in large volume. It's easy to get that from a warehouse. In uh, 2020, what, what are your chances? The opportunity is either to go to the junkyard and hope that there's another one you can uh, scavenge the part from or take the part, model it up, 3D print it pretty effortlessly. So this is a great example and there's uh, countless parts like this where with, uh, now that it's relatively straightforward to 3D print without it being a big industrial operation, you're gonna see a whole lot of, just, just where um, sort of hobbyist uh, plastic printing was uh, 10, 15 years ago. And this of course applies to a broad range of um, broad range of products. So here's a few consumer products examples, golf clubs, I think I already showed that, but imagine, imagine here's a, I think it's a seven iron. It is a seven iron. Look at that. You can, uh, by the way, you can directly print right on the, right on the part. I think that's pretty pretty cool. Anyway, you can imagine all the variables that you might want to tweak for a custom club. Tweak them and then either make 10, uh, one or 10 for sort of a bespoke kind of operation or print 100,000 of them uh, with everyone being a little bit different with the binder jetting solutions. Another example is, um, let's say you have a faucet and you want to customize the faucet. So you can imagine printing it again, uh, designing them, uh, and it could even be uh, literally a consumer s defines a few parameters, the geometry is updated because you have a modern parametric feature-based solid modeler, and then you print it. So here's one of these faucets printed. This one happens to be printed uh, on the studio system. Studio system is great for low volume kind of production. Um, there's a need for more, you'd use the production system or, or the shop system. So here it is printed on a support, and uh, here's here it is before it is polished. So the surface finish here is probably in the order of uh, 10 micron average roughness. 
so 10 micron RA. Uh, and then it can be, of course, polished or uh, really finished with, a, finished with a broad array of uh, finishing methods. I'm gonna show you guys just some, some of the methods available. Uh, but really, anything you can do to metal, you can do to these parts. They're the metal alloys you're used to. So these are steel parts. It's actually a guitar tailpiece uh, printed. And then uh, they're just polished or black nickel, gold plated, copper plated, etc. Again, everything, everything you can do with uh, metal parts, you can do with these parts. You can make uh, custom bespoke uh, handles, uh, belt buckles, just to give you a, a sense. And the last example, I think this is the last example I'll show you, is uh, this great example from Turner Motorsport. So Turner Motorsport is a leading BMW race team, but also BMW tuner in North America. And tuner meaning you have a BMW, you wanna trick it out, you wanna uh, customize it for improved performance, uh, they're the team to go to. So. They are doing a very interesting project, which marries a 2001 BMW M3, which was in some ways a, a, a real classic car because of the connection between the wheels through the steering column uh, to, to the steering wheel. And so they wanted to keep that exact feel, uh, but put in a modern V8 engine in there. Now, they wanted to put the engine in, without changing anything about the steering, this, uh, the steering column and that whole path. The linkage between the road and the steering wheel is absolutely key in this case. And so how do you do that? You have to redesign the original engine mounts. And so the original engine mounts were taken out, scanned, uh, then put into a generative design software that basically respected the keep out zones and then added material, removed material, starting with the original engine mount, uh, removed material, just like a tree branch is no thicker than it needs to be to support whatever's attached to it. Um, this removes material where there's low stresses, adds material where there's high stresses until, it's, uh, uh, until everything is within the safety limits that you define. And uh, here is the part, the geometry actually growing within the software. This software, this particular software is uh, live parts from desktop metal. There are other generative design tools out there. But the point of this is this. This, you could have created this geometry uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But what you couldn't have done is then manufacture this shape. This is a very organic, interesting shape that it doesn't lend itself to something like machining. With 3D printing it, and uh, you could actually go through multiple designs, iterate. Here you're seeing an intermediate design where, where there was actually interference with the bolts. No problem. Reprint it, model it, uh, simulate again, and uh, reprint. Here is the final two-piece design. And here it is, again, digital, reduced to practice. So here are the parts. Here are the two engine mounts. And I have one of them here in the studio. Here, here's one of them. What you might notice is that there's a seam right there. This part is so huge, it couldn't be printed as one piece in the studio system. The studio system build box is about 12 inches by eight by eight. Uh, and so no problem, it was printed in two pieces and welded together, welded together beautifully. So here's the engine. Here's the engine mount, as you can see, uh, the spacing is very tight, very tight. Um, no problem for 3D printing. The geometric complexity is free. Now picture trying to either machine that, that would be maybe next to impossible, or cast it. I think this, this is a part that could be cast with some modifications, but it would be quite tricky and you didn't, wouldn't have the same design and iteration flexibility. So that's a great example of uh, part design customization. The business impact is, Rapid prototyping and engineering, you can now uh, evaluate multiple designs in parallel, uh, optimize the critical parts for to both minimize mass because these racing teams, they want to remove every gram of metal that they can remove. So this isn't just a space saving. This is a, how do I remove the mass uh, and yet still have a strong enough part? And it's, got a, it's a geometry that is just unattainable with other, with other processes. Um, 
So it's really breakthrough innovation in the hands of a small team. You don't have to be General Motors or BMW to be able to take advantage of uh, 3D printing. So the bottom line for supply chains is that you get better products, you can make better parts, and you have higher operational efficiency. You compress the time, you compress the non-recurring engineering uh, charges, uh, and you reduce inventory. And it's a much more productive way to create either customized or replacement parts. So, so that is it in a nutshell. Uh, the next step, if any of this uh, sounds relevant to you, be happy to explore with you whether um, one of our 3D printing solutions might be a fit. So we invite you for, uh, to engage with us in a one-on-one in -on -one meeting with uh, one of our specialists, and we can really work together to see is there a place for fit, and if there is, identify some parts, maybe uh, do some sort of a benchmark, uh, produce the metrics of what it would take to create these, uh, these parts, either in low quantity or, or mass production. And uh, it makes sense to you know, produce one of these parts. All right, you've been very kind with your time. I just see there's no open questions. I think my colleagues answered the ones that came up. And uh, let's see. All right, thank you very much. Uh, if, if there's additional questions, feel free to email me, Ilya at desktopmetal.com. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you at one of these webinars. Have a great day, everybody.